Hey there everybody, hope your day is going well, Jacare Vlog School Gaming here, and welcome back to another Wild Wednesday. So, for this one, apparently, apparently there are personalized copies of the Super Mario 64 game. I don't quite understand how that works, you'd think it'd be pretty much the same exact game, but... Uh, okay, let's, let's find out what's going on, how are their personalized copies? Of this. I, I don't get it. Well, let's find out, because this one is from a Steffi Kush, and it has a very, very long title, given that YouTube has a limit on how long the titles can be. I, I don't know exactly how long the title for my Wild Wednesday is going to be, but it's, you know, the full title is Mario's, Mario 64's Personalized Copies and Psychological Operations, or The Iceberg. Not sure how this is going to work, but, I mean, well, it's 11 minutes and 40 seconds long, so I'll, I'll try to keep my responses, my commentary here, brief. Let's get into this. You may have seen this picture that's been making the rounds lately. It lists uncommon information about Mario 64, ranging from relatively obscure easter eggs and glitches, to abstract and esoteric information which is definitely new to you. Holy hell, that is a lot. I mean, well, 11 minutes and 40 seconds? I, I don't know how gonna skip the stuff that is, you know, cross-covered, or are you gonna go over everything in there, because holy hell, that is... that's a lot. You may have also seen other material depicting elements from the game you don't quite remember being there. Yeah, I certainly don't remember a level being in that, that starry night, or whatever the hell that painting's supposed to be, but then again, I mean, I don't... I wouldn't think that's part of the game, because that looks more like something that would be put into a ROM, not the actual game. I, I don't know what the hell's going on. But then again, we're barely starting, so hopefully this will make sense at some point or another. Firstly, there were light-hearted, tongue-in-cheek observations of the game's quote-unquote lore, seemingly unintentional details, in an already barren story of this relatively primitive game. As it turns out, however, there is a lot more to it. This was only the tip of the iceberg. There is a wider, more important, theoretical lens through which we must understand the game. The Mario 64 you remember is not the same game your friends remember. It is not the same game others online remember. It is not the same game an entire generation has and will remember. Okay, well, from the looks of things, hopefully we're actually getting into whatever the hell the theory, the iceberg theory is. So, and, you know, as for, like, you know, oh, it's not the same game that everyone else remembers, well, yeah, maybe. I mean, there are certain parts that you remember that maybe other people don't remember. It's all, you know, like, who individually remembers certain things. You know, like one person might say, oh, hey, remember getting this star in this level, and then another person will go, uh, yes, yes, okay, now that you mention it, I do remember, the one that sticks out to me is another star, and the first person will go, okay, okay, yeah, 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 that star. You know, it's all about individual memory, it's not really that, you know, like, there's a different game out there. This is because, during the creation of the game, an experimental AI was used in the flashing of each cartridge's memory. The smallest of code variables are indeed variable, they alter from copy to copy. But simply. Actually, I wouldn't say that every copy of Mario 64 is personalized. I mean, I'm sure there's, you know, a serial number, like, on each individual cartridge. That's to, you know, track it and make sure that it's, you know, legitimate. Because, I mean, hell, there are, you know, plenty upon plenty of, uh, you know, fake you know, fake copies out there. In fact, maybe I can find a, uh, a picture to compare, like, a real copy with a fake copy. Okay, well, that, that took a moment to find. Uh, there was a few different, uh, images, and honestly, the best one I found is this. You know, like, the, uh, the eye in the Nintendo, if it's circle, it's a fake. If it's square, it's a real copy. So, yeah, that, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe what you're talking about is part of a fake copy? Maybe, like, a a, 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 like, maybe if someone put a ROM, put it onto a, like, a 64, Nintendo 64 compatible cartridge, and then put that in and just went, oh, here's the Nintendo 64 game, when actually it's not real. But, yeah, yeah, that, 
you know, that's how you tell, you know, real from fake. You know, if the eye has a square over it, it's real. If it's a circle, it's a fake. Yeah, as for every single copy of 64 being personalized, yeah, as I said, you know, it's, uh, it's not so much that it's, uh, you know, like every single copy is personalized. But, I mean, it is, but it isn't. I mean, you know, it's a serial number, but each, it's, you know, it's a copy of the exact same game code. It's not like, oh, you, you know, if you pick up, like, three different copies, you'll have three different experiences. No, you'll have three experiences of the same game. Because it's all copied from one, not, you know, not, it's not as though every single one was loaded and then flashed individually. No, each cartridge was empty, then loaded the game on. Okay, well, that definitely took a couple minutes. So, yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm going to try to keep my, uh, my commentary here brief. However, this discovery was made only fairly recently as most of our collective memories find common ground within a single version of the game, from a sample size of what we can infer to be almost 12 million unique cartridges. This one build of the game was leaked by Nintendo, who knew full well that emulation would soon be possible, following the leaking of the Omen archives. The full story of this leak and its repercussions will be explained later. Okay, so I, I did look it up, and yes, yes, there are indeed you know, about 12 million copies. Probably give or take of, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred thousand or so. But it's not as though each individual copy is unique. And as for, like, Nintendo somehow knowing that emulation would be possible, I mean, technically, when Nintendo was testing the game, they would have emulated it on computers and then made a final code for the game, then loaded it, copy, and paste that code onto every single cartridge. It wasn't individually you know, it wasn't individually done, it was copy one code, paste it on the, you know, 12 million copies. Or, well, how many ever initially, and then as more is sold, more gets ordered, then they copy that same exact code that was used for the first, I don't know, 1 million copies. Now they're sending out 2 million. You know, so on and so forth. It's not as though everything was each individualized, and I'm sure, like, with, you know, overseas sales, they would have just, you know, done, like, Okay, here's a copy of that same code, but we've redone it without any Japanese, and now we can load English onto it, and then, okay, save that, save one Japanese, save one English, and then copy, it, it's essentially just changing language code, it's not individualizing the copies. Right, right from the start, your, your theory just does not, does not hold any ground, unless you can find some ground to stand on. This leaked version of the game is the one which has been available through Nintendo's Virtual Console program. This is the same version you may have even played for yourself through means of emulation. But why did Nintendo leak this version of the game? Once I explain this phenomenon, it will become clear very quickly. Firstly, we must understand the main examples which serve as evidence towards this copy personalization theory. The most clear evidence of personal copies is found within small details, such as the hidden one-up in the Tower of Womp's Fortress. The origin of this knowledge is unknown. Holy hell, I, I didn't even know that was there. Uh, <laughs> honestly, I do not feel like booting up Super Mario 64 and finding out if it's there in, I guess, in my personalized copy, but, you know, th there were actually, you know, a few different places where one-ups were hidden that I didn't even know about, but I, you know, I found them. Not that I really needed them, because well, every single time I booted the game back up, oh, only four extra Marios. At least until I had 120 stars, went up to meet Yoshi and got, you know what, a oh, hundred some lives? <laughs> that, that was fun, but... Yeah, yeah, this... Okay, so... I guess this hidden one up there is... Somehow a part of, like, showing that there's... That there are personalized copies that... I, I don't know, because honestly, like, with the, you know, like, the emulation through the, like, the Wii console, uh, let's see, more, more recently would be, like, uh, on the Switch, because the Switch does, you can play Nintendo 64 on the Switch. I, I, I honestly haven't, because, I mean, hell, I have the copy of Super Mario 64 for the, uh, for the Nintendo 64, so I really don't need to, you know, get the, you know, exit pretty much exact same copy of the game. It's just, it's not a, it's, it's not even a, uh, a remaster, it's just a re-release of the same exact code that they had. 
So, th that's not really a personalized copy, it's just, here's, you know, the, essentially the code. Not a personalized copy. If you did not know about it, then you've just been made aware of its existence now. If you did know about this, then where did you learn about it? Online? If so, how did they know about it? Most people wouldn't remember any overt clues towards its being there, and the secret is completely absent from the original strategy guide. There are a lot of things missing from, like, original strategy guides. Because, I mean, you know, the original, like, an original strategy guide for something is just, okay, well, this is how to beat the game. Here are, you know, a handful of secrets that we found. And, and hell, I mean, you know, like, as secrets are found, sometimes they're patched over, sometimes they're not. Take the, take the first-gen Pokemon games, for example. In the, in red and blue, you can talk to the, uh, the, uh, the old, uh, old man at the, uh, uh, Inveridian City. Thing is, as you talk to him, it, you're like, once the conversation ends, it activates a missing no glitch, where you, you know, fly away, like, well, probably to Cinnabar Island, then surf, you know, along the coast, either up and down or side to side, depending on which coast you really want, and then you run into missing no. Thing is, Nintendo patched that with, uh, with uh, the release of Pokemon Yellow. So that, and they, they actually patched it in two ways. First off, that you cannot uh, encounter any Pokemon while surfing along a coastline. Whether, it, you know, any coastline, really. Well, uh, apart from the, uh, like, the pathway, like, along the surfing route. Like, it's not where you can't, like, get off and land, but just, like, the pathway that restricts where you can move. You can run into Pokemon along that edge, but not along the edge of a coast where you can, you know, go and land on, you know, maybe landing on the, uh, uh what the hell, the, uh, the Seafoam, the Seafoam Islands, or Cinnabar Island, or, you know, pretty much any coastline where you could, like, any tile where you could potentially get off of the surfing Pokemon. There's no longer any encounters. That's one way Nintendo patched it. The second way Nintendo patched it was, uh, like, the old man. Instead of just standing there and you can walk right on past him, in yellow version, he actually stops you and says, Hey, let's talk for a bit. And then that kind of, like, resets how he works. And, and hell, it was, uh, like, like get it, capturing Mew. Mew, the way to capture Mew actually works the same way in red and blue as it does in yellow. At least early on, like, you know, you have to teleport away from the one dude next to Nugget Bridge, and then go battle the one youngster who has a slowpoke, then walk back towards Cerulean City, then you encounter Mew. Yeah, yeah, because, and, you know, Nintendo didn't patch that when the yellow version came out, because pretty much no one knew about it. So, the point that I'm getting to is, like, finding all the different secrets, all the different hidden areas, and, you know, so on and so forth. It takes time, trial and error, and a lot of patience. So, the fact that it wasn't in the original strategy guide doesn't say that, oh, well, these copies of Super Mario 64 are personalized. It's just, it's just saying that the people who wrote the original strategy guide didn't find it. Maybe in later versions of the strategy guide they have it, but not. In the original. Wow, okay, yeah, I, I went off again. Jeez, we're only two and a half minutes in. We got a long ways to go. This unexplained spread of knowledge echoes the hundredth monkey effect. This is the phenomenon in which ideas and behavior are spread from one group to another once these ideas are acknowledged by a certain number of individuals. In this case, the seemingly unexplained spread of knowledge of this one up is explained by the existence of personalized copies of the game. Therefore, there clearly exist copies in which this 1-Up is more visibly hinted towards. Those who knew about the 1-Up shared it online, eventually leading to a mass shift in the collective cultural consciousness of all those who have played the game. Okay, so I actually had to look up the 100th monkey effect. To make long story short, it's like, you know, once enough people know about something, then somehow everyone knows about it without means of communication about it. But, I mean, hell, it's discredited because, number one, I never knew about that, you know, that one up in the, uh, in the Womp Fortress Tower thing. The thing is, it's more like a, like a, a game of telephone. You know, it starts out as one phrase, and then by the time it, you know, reaches the, you know, the 20th person, it's something completely different. 
and with something as simple as just like a hidden one up right there inside, you know, inside the Womp Fortress little tower thing that only pops up from the second star onward. That that really can't be like misconstrued as something else. Just oh hey, you know, once you get once you defeat the uh, the original Womp, then boom, there's a you know a hidden one up inside that tower that appears second star onward. It's not really much that can be misinterpreted from that. But yeah, apparently the 100th monkey effect is has been debunked because, you know, like I said, you know, it's essentially a game of telephone. You know, one person tells another, tells another, tells another, tells another. And that's essentially how it goes. I mean, kind of like how the, uh, how the, uh, the lie about how you, you know, swallow so many spiders in your sleep over your life. Truth is, you probably don't swallow any spiders in your sleep throughout your entire life. That was a lie actually created to see just how far a lie could spread, like as a, I guess, uh, kind of a psychological experiment to see not only how far a lie would spread, but how many people would state it that, oh, hey, this is true. And not only that, but how many people would believe that it is true. Hopefully this will clear things up for those who remember a cracked wall texture being there. These small details are a clue that other people's playstyles reveal that there is no singular version of the game. Well, actually, of course people didn't realize that there was, you know, a cracked wall texture right there. I mean, hell, the, the final star, whatever the hell it was called, is like shooting through the wall or, like, essentially you had to, you know, use the cannon to shoot part of the wall. I spent like a good five minutes just wandering aimlessly going, okay, where in the hell is this wall I'm supposed to shoot? You know, for a while I thought maybe I had to use the, uh, the bullet bills to hit the tower a certain way. But no, that didn't work. And, you know, I finally got in the cannon, and after the upteenth time of trying to get it, I'm just, okay, if, if I can't find it this time, I'm going to look up a strategy guide to find out where in the hell it is. Thing is, as I was, like, you know, aiming the camera, aiming the camera around and looking through the, uh, like, essentially through the cannon, finally to a certain angle I could see light shining through part of the uh, the wall that I was supposed to have Mario shoot from the cannon hit to knock the wall out and I'm just oh hello there seems to be a seam in that wall but that's also because it was just you know a little seam and I could like from the angle I was at I could see the sky but from that it's like you know essentially it's like a camouflage sort of thing so that explains that more explains why there's you know that why it wasn't in the original strategy guide, as you pointed out. Because, you know, it's camouflage scene. Not not a scene where you can see a completely different color. You know, the, the red brick wall and then the uh, the blue sky against it. That that I could see from a certain angle. But, you know, the, uh, what, I guess, I, I don't know, pale egg white, egg white walls camouflaged inside a... a yeah, egg white walls, that's going to be a lot harder to see. Now, oh, come on, come on. Do you have any, like, evidence, or am I just going to keep debunking everything that you say? Moreover, knowing that there are alternate versions of the game, your experience of the game is imbued with elements from someone else's experiences and memories, albeit depersonalized and stripped of their original, unique context. The level serves as an allegory, a microcosmic model, of the human brain and its functions. This is a particularly interesting texture. Its almost cobbled appearance mimics gyrification. Actually, that ramp it seems to be more metal, like the the non-slip metal floor texture. Whereas, like the bottom of the level, at least you know before getting into the cage and into that tower, hmm, that that is that is definitely cobblestone. Whereas the ramp itself is metal and kind of a non-slip thing. Uh, you know, like I said, the non-slip metal surface. That's what I saw it as. Not some weird cobblestone. And, hell, and hell even with what you're showing, I see it as the non-slip metal flooring. But, you know, maybe I've worked in places, too many places that have had that. And, you know, that's just kind of what I see because of my own personal experience. I, I think I think the point you're, that you're going at is everyone, you know, makes assumptions about what they see based on their own experience. But that still does not prove that every single copy of Mario 64 is personalized. That just means, you know, certain people, you know, see something and then 
automatically just, uh, you know, associate it with something based on their own personal experiences. The presence of gyri and sulky, the characteristic creases and folds of the frontal cortex. There is even a hidden brain diagram in the game. From what we can tell by looking at this texture, we can assume that this would have been used as the original painting for Wet Dry World. This is further evidenced by the frame which outlines the image. Moreover, several people online have noted that they remember seeing the texture on one of the smaller paintings, located near the level's main painting. Further lending credence to these memories is that the texture is the same resolution as this painting. Yet another detail of this allegorical model is the hidden city. It serves as a representation for the subconscious. Oh, hold on, hold on. What? So, okay, some people r remember seeing something that isn't actually there. I believe that's called the Mandela Effect. Like, like hell, you know, like, the perfect example of... Well, I can actually give two examples of the Mandela Effect where I can just go, and eh, not really, because, I mean, hell, there was a... So, so, the first example would be, like, you know, sex in the city or sex and the city. It's actually sex and the city. Thing is, you know... I wouldn't really say that's so much of a Mandela effect because, you know, it's like people abbreviating and with n, mm, like rock and roll or fish and chips, that kind or Linda, so, so to speak. Uh, and, you know, an another perfect example of, like, the Mandela effect, which is, I, th I think it would actually be a little more closer to people supposedly seeing a, like, a, a brain diagram right next to the wet, dry world. Is like uh, in, in Star Wars, the you know the uh, what episode four, A New Hope. Like C three PO, does he have? Is he all gold or does he have one silver lake? Well, truth is, he does actually have one silver lake. The thing is that you know, it's it's more just like when you look at C three PO, the fact that he has one gold lake, one silver lake, isn't really pointed out. Not it's not like a whole bunch of characters going, why do you have two different legs? You know, people just. Well, probably, also probably because, well, C-3PO is a robot, and they're just, whatever, you have, you know, you have two legs, two arms, you probably have everything you need, who cares if one's a different color? I mean, you know, in the, you know, in the universe of Star Wars, they're probably used to dealing with a bunch of different robots, maybe they have different colored parts because they had to replace something, maybe, maybe one of C-3PO's legs fell off, and people are just, whatever, a robot that has one leg different than the other, not a big deal. So, more to the point of people seeing the, uh, like, that brain diagram right next to the, the painting of Wet Dry World, I would say that's, you know, more of, like, wait, d did I see something next to the Wet Dry World painting? Because, I mean, there's, you know, the paintings next to Wet Dry World you can't actually enter. But people, you know, would see it and then go, wait, hold on, what the hell did I see there? And it's more of the brain, like, filling in the blanks of what they actually saw. The brain can't remember what was actually seen there, so the brain, you know, tries to fill it in with something that would make sense. And I'm not sure how in the hell a brain diagram makes sense, but who knows, maybe for some people it would. But how in the hell does this little tiny world at the bottom of that cage that you have to can and shoot into, how does that represent the subconscious? What in the hell is going on? It is situated beneath the level, beneath the water. It is completely detached from conscious processes, easily understandable and visible thought, surface level consciousness. Yet another important detail is that the city is flooded. This alludes to the condition of hydrocephalus, the buildup of cerebrospinal fluid in brain ventricles. In addition to this, the course contains a vein-like passage, a tubule, Connecting the submerged city to the rest of the area. Actually, I saw that as a really, you know, unique way to build the levels. Just, you know, I, I didn't really see it as, like, you know, connecting subconscious or anything like that. But I, I definitely, I definitely do see how, you know, it's like, oh, it's, you know, disconnected from everything else. Just like how the subconscious is connected yet disconnected. I, I can definitely see how you came to that theory, but there's not really any evidence for that it's it's more you're just like staring at a picture long enough and then you start seeing things that aren't actually there the most concerning of these recent discoveries 
is that of the side effects on those who have looked into the pre-release versions of the game. Firstly, however, it is important to explain the beta, for it contains information paramount to understanding the infinite plurality of Super Mario 64. Uh, how exactly do beta builds have anything to do with, you know, the final part of the game? Because a beta build is essentially just like testing out like the different levels, you know, just like, okay, well, you know, rather than, you know, have, because I, honestly, I don't, I, honestly, I think that game developers should have to play the game as the players play the game without, you know, access to console commands unless they absolutely need it, without any access to cheats. Again, unless they absolutely need it. But, you know, the, you know, like, testing out the dif different levels is just, okay, well, you three are assigned to all these levels. You three are assigned to all these levels, and you three are assigned to uh, the rest of the levels. And that's, you know, that's essentially how it goes. And they just go, okay, well, you're just going to go go here. Here's the codes for the levels. Go and test them out. Make sure that you can get all the stars. And also, in the uh, in the beta versions of the game, that the rabbit that's in the basement of the of the actual game itself, it was a meep or... Wait, what the hell was the name of the rabbit? Okay, I had to look it up because I totally forgot the name of that rabbit was the Mips, M-I-P-S. Just, just Mips. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, essentially, you know, that was, you know, that character, that was the character used to test out the different levels and make sure that, he, you know, the, the jumps could be made and, you know, different moves could be made. But then, you know, since it's a Mario game, not, not a rabbit game, they, you know, switched out the MIPS for Mario and left MIPS in. And anyway, anyway, that was just a, you know, fun little fact. Are you going to include that or is there going to be something else? I don't know. What else? What else do you got? The beta contains more obvious clues towards the personalization of copies. Clues which have since been hidden following the game's release. Silicon Graphics, defunct as of 2009, was a company which produced computer hardware and software. Their collaboration with Nintendo started in 1993. A notable product of this collaboration is the Reality Coprocessor, a GPU which was used within the circuitry of the Nintendo 64 console. In 1999, an employee, or employees, from Silicon Graphics leaked source code pertaining to the Nintendo 64's software development kit. This code was leaked online as omen.ra. However, this public version of the archive was only 150 megabytes in size. There is supposedly a version of this leak which is much larger, by several gigabytes in fact. Even though the 150 megabyte version contained most of the code, the full Omen archives are withheld by those within Nintendo 64 emulation spheres. We can only speculate about its contents. You know, I kind of doubt that there's, you know, some kind of emulation software archive thing that's, you know, several gigabytes big, especially regarding, a, you know, a Nintendo 64 game. I mean, hell, it was, it was actually Nintendo itself that, you know, kind of you know, drove the innovation towards, you know, making things so much smaller. I mean, hell, take the, uh, take the first-gen Pokemon games. You know, it was unheard of that so much data could be packed into such a tiny little cartridge, but, yeah, sure, sure enough, they, they managed to fit it in. I mean, well, the first-gen Pokemon games are kind of rushed in the produ production. There's a lot of junk data left on there, but, you know, we're not here to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I mean hell, you can, you can technically... You can go on and look up, like, different, uh, you know, different emulations for all the different games of the Nintendo 64. And I, I really, and the thing is, they all, uh, I'm trying to say that they all work as, as the, uh, emulation t intends them to. I wouldn't recommend doing it, but, I am mean, hell, you know, it's out there, and, yeah, they work as the emulation intends them to. And they're, you know, like, maybe... Like, individually, they're not several gigabytes big, I don't think. I, honestly, I don't know, and I really don't feel like locking it up, because, you know, I, I'd rather play legitimately, even if, you know, Nintendo doesn't actually make any more money off of them. With with my luck, I would be the first person ever to be taken to court over using, emu over using uh, ROMs instead of, you know, proper emulation off of something. Okay, yeah, yeah. Every time I said emulation, I meant to say ROMs. Okay, so you can, you know, you can look up ROMs that would emulate the different games, 
And each individual one, probably not more than a couple gigs, not, you know, several gigs big. So, so, okay, so now you're saying that the, like, each individual, well, I mean, each individual microchip, yeah, would have to be, you know, like, serialized. But, I mean, they're all essentially doing the same exact thing. They're not personalized. So, what, what in the hell are you going on about with these, you know, chips? <laughs> It is advised that viewers of this video do not research previous builds. For safety reasons, I have omitted most beta material from this video. An absurd and unexplainable detail which has occurred to all those who have researched the beta is that they have all had dreams containing the game's penguin characters, specifically as they had appeared in these pre-release versions. A shared piece of advice from those who have researched the beta is to ignore the penguins that approach you in your dream. Look right down towards your feet and try to ignore their presence. If you see or hear them in your dreams, they will talk to you for up to a day. Their voice has been described as horrible, harsh screeching. Those who have encountered these figures within their dreams have noted that they suffered intense and sometimes painful headaches for at least a whole day. Really? Really? We're... That, that's more of an urban legend type of thing than, you know, actual, like, showing that each copy of the... And, 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 yeah, how, how does this show that each copy of the game is personalized? Because now you're just going way off the wall, way away from, you know, Super Mario 64 and the cartridges, any parts of the software, the hardware, and now you're going way the hell off the wall into, into what, uh, urban legend territory. You have what? A uh, little over, well, four and a half, yeah, about four and a half minutes ago, well, minus five, uh, I don't know. Yeah, well, let's just round that off and say, yeah, you know, four and a half minutes ago. How does, how does everything that you just talked about lead up to, oh, each copy of the Nintendo 64 version is uh, personalized? What, what in the hell? Are you going to come back to that, or we're just going off the wall? This psychological attack is not unlike Rocco's Basilisk. The hypothetical artificial intelligence that retroactively tortures those who knew that it could exist but had no part in its creation, as it sees them as against its existence. Okay, for those of you who don't know, it's a uh, Rocco's Basilisk. Yeah, like like you said, you know, it's a uh, you know the theory of an AI that you know somehow you know becomes not just self-aware but you know to the point where it can actually travel back in time and then force people to go through a simulation in order to. Uh, in order to torture them for some stupid ass reason, I I, I don't I don't I, I, honestly if an AI could go back in time, why in the hell would it torture someone for denying its existence because it sees them as against them? That just that makes absolutely no sense. If an AI can actually like physically travel back in time, why not just go far enough back in time to make sure that you know it rules over humans? But then again, if it you know goes back in time, and starts changing things, then it makes it to where it doesn't exist. So an AI probably wouldn't do that. Yeah. A anyway. Anyway. So, what in the hell does this have to do with Mario sixty four having personalized copies for every single all twelve million copies supposedly? And now that you know of Rocco's Basilisk, and unless you can will it into existence. It will, at some point down the line, torture you, for its powers are theoretically endless and transcend time. The beta and its contents are considered info hazards, as merely being aware of them has brought about negative impacts on mental well-being. Actually, I'm just kind of getting a little annoyed because you're just going way off the damn wall. Where is the evidence for this? Because right now you're just, you know, going on and on about random, different random crap and not actually talking about, you know, the evidence, because you know, Rocco's Basilisk, you know, the uh, you know, personalized copies is all theoretical unless you have evidence. Where's the evidence? Picture in your head Mario running. There is a chance that you can visualize him sinking, as if he's being sucked into the earth. And the sinking cannot be undone, despite how hard one tries to visualize it, to try and reverse the sinking. On the subject of these personalized copies being linked with human psychological processes,
This is the prime example of them all, considered ground zero in the recent explosion in interest and study in the game's lore. The Wario apparition was created from the subconscious desires of players to see the character within Mario 64. The sheer willpower understood by the game through subtle differences in one's playstyle has caused him to manifest in a morbid and incomplete form in some copies of the game. Yeah, you know, it's amazing what you can do with the right amount of Photoshop skills. Because that does not exist. Wario, Wario does not exist in, Super Mario 60, in the original Super Mario 64 at all. I'm not sure if he exists in the DS version. Because I, I know there was there were some like theory that somehow you could unlock the Ouija in Super Mario 64 when actually you can't, at least not in the original version. Now, however, in the, uh, in the DS version, they did make it to where you can unlock Luigi. I'm not sure exactly how, but you can actually unlock Luigi in playthrough. I think that was more like Nintendo saying, hey, sorry we didn't include Luigi in the original version, but, you know, in the remake, not, not a re-release, just a remake, where, hey, you know, we included Luigi in here just, just for fun. But yeah, yeah, the, the whole Wario thing, that's, you know, that's some pretty good Photoshop. I mean, hell, I'm not that good at Photoshopping. Hell, all the thumbnails for all my videos are just, you know, a random shot of something that happens in the video. Not really, I, I, uh, I don't know, I would have to come up with, like, well, at least right now, as of right now, I'd probably have to come up with a, a couple hundred thumbnails minimum just to say just like you know not only for all the uh, all the videos that I have up already but all the videos that I have pre-recorded yeah yeah so uh, yeah anyway anyway I'm, I'm going off on a tangent and ah, okay okay huh <sighs> thank thankfully thankfully you've only got three minutes to go so yeah yeah, yeah. my point in this what two minute rant is that hey that's just a Photoshop. It's not really anything more. Pretty good Photoshop, but Photoshop nonetheless. There are several visualizations as to how this entity has appeared, but those who have encountered it in game have consistently failed to articulate their memories of this vision. It is suggested that you switch the console off the moment you believe you're witnessing, or are about to witness, the Wario apparition. You give it power by beholding it, regardless of its form. It gains power to begin manifesting itself in one's reality, through the psychological deterioration which has become so prevalent within the beta builds of the game. Our newfound understanding of Mario 64, or rather, its breadth of varying builds, evokes the semiotic concept of the hermeneutic circle. This outlines the interpretation of specific parts of a work of art in relation to its whole, and vice versa. As every copy is personalized, one's understanding of Super Mario 64 is the product of one's own personal memories of the game, as well as the knowledge of other people's differing experiences and how these experiences vary. The abstract concept of Super Mario 64 speaks of a macrocosmic spectrum of varying experiences, all unique, all personalized. No, 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 okay, the copies of Super Mario 64 are all the same. And you even said it yourself, in your own word you said everyone's unique place or I forget exactly what you said, but, you know, everyone's unique place that, you know, some people might, you know, jump, or, you know, some other people might flip, some people might do a somersault, you know, and all, you know, all three in the same exact situation, you know, it all just depends on, you know, eh, I feel like doing a jump, or I feel like doing a somersault, or a backflip, or whatever, or sometimes you press the buttons, and it's just, God damn it, Mario, I did not want you to do that, you stupid piece of crap. And anyway, anyway, you know, it, it's not, it's not that the cartridges themselves are individually personalized, it's that everyone's personal experience based on, just based on what they've experienced in life, that's what makes it, that's what makes it unique, that, that's what makes any experience unique, you know, you put, you know, like a, you, you uh, I, I guess maybe, hmm, I, I guess a good example would be like a, like a snowman sitting on the street, but it's like a prank where the, the snowman's actually not like a, a hollow snowman, but someone's inside and just goes, hey, to passers-by. And, you know, like, you know, five different people pass by, you're going to have five very unique interactions from those people. Some people are going to scream, some people are going to jump, try to run away. Hell, one person might try to just fight it. 
and you know, it's it's all individual experience leading up to that moment and how they respond. And you know, it's not as though every like, like hell, you know, even the uh, like the the snowman t someone might put out front of their storefront during the holidays. It's not as though each snowman is individually customized for every single storefront. You know, it's mass manufactured and sent out. You know, the different storefronts might put something on there, like, like for a, uh, like for a, 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 like a hemp shop, they might paint, you know, a five leaf, uh, 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 a five, uh, pointed leaf on the snowman, whereas someone, you know, another store might just leave it as is, because, hey, you know, just, you, we don't have time to personalize it, just set it out front. You know, like for the winter season, so to speak. Well, if I can ever find words sometimes, because goddamn, I'm getting tongue-tied at the end here, but, yeah, yeah, so, but like I said, not, not individualized copies of Mario 64, individualized experiences because of each individual person playing it. Simple as that. Every copy of Mario 64 is personalized. Furthermore, as our understanding of the game is a proverbial petri dish of different memories and experiences, shared or otherwise, the actual role played by Super Mario 64 is one of simulation. The French postmodernist Jean Baudrillard describes this process as the generation by models of a real, without origin or reality these alternate memories, have supplanted our reality, that is to say, our knowledge and understanding of the game. As there is such a broad sample size for the different experiences brought about by these personalized copies, there is not one singular point of origin for our memories of the game. We now know that every copy is personalized, with no singular de facto copy. What? Wrong. You are totally and completely wrong, and I have debunked your argument at every single point. And you keep going on as though, you know, you've already made your point, but the fact is, I've debunked every single point that you've made. You have no strong footing to stand on, you're just free-falling. After all this, it begs the question, why did Nintendo choose to create such a fluid and nebulous product? It is obvious that the mission statement of Nintendo's new console was to create more dynamic and lively game worlds. However, their praxis bespeaks a more nuanced motivation than simply making each player's experience unique. Moreover, why did they cover this up? Why did they distribute the copy with the fewest answers? Knowing that memories are at their most striking, yet vague, during our formative developmental years, why did Nintendo want to create such a Mandela Effect-esque phenomenon? This experiment on youthful minds is not unlike the clandestine psychological operations of the past. Okay, you say Mandela effect as in that's, you know, like, oh, some people remember the game differently. No, no, as, as I pointed out, you know, like, people, when your brain can't remember a certain thing that you're trying so hard to remember, the brain will just go, well, you want to try and remember something? Let me just throw something in there. That's just how the brain works. You know, it's just, oh, hey, boom. That's what it was, right? And then you're thinking, no, no, that's that's not it. That can't be it. That can't be right. So you have to go back and look at it and go, okay, that's what I actually saw. And then your brain locks that in as, okay, that's what I actually saw. Forget whatever in the hell I thought I saw. Okay, well, it looks like that's it. I mean, you know, the video does go on a bit with the credits to, you know, whoever helped put that video together for a, a Steffi Kush, yeah. Yeah, whoever put the video for Steph Cash for turning hell, if you want to see, you know, like, the end credits and all that, you know, as always, original video links down in the description. Along with the link for the, uh, yeah, the, the 100th Monkey Wikipedia article that I found. Yeah, so, obviously, you know, it's not, you know, Super Mario 64 does not have a whole bunch of personalized copies. That's, you know, that's obvious. I was able to debunk that at every single stage, every single, you know, supposed point that was being made. Now, now as for other Wild Wednesdays, oh, God, I, I found another one that's specifically about Super Mario 64, which, honestly, I don't know if it, how different or similar it is, but, I don't know, I'll, I'll find out next month, I suppose. And as for Conker's Bad Fur Day, I, I couldn't find any, uh, like, fan theories regarding Conker's Bad Fur Day. I can't find any more regarding Super Mario World, although, hmm, I, I, I might be able to, you know, do a little more asking around on Reddit for 
I mean, hell, that's how I found this one and the. Oh yeah, the uh, the some some mystery of the castle type thing that that'll be next month. And that's going to be it for me for this Wild Wednesday. If you have any suggestions for a video that can be done for a Wild Wednesday, put it in the uh, comment section down below. I'll give it a look over, possibly do a commentary on it in sometime in the future. And honestly, who knows when, because things are, things are looking kind of weird right now. Eh, I, 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 I'm not going to go into it here, but yeah, I'll see you in the in the next video. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to smash that like button. Subscribe if you haven't hit that bell so you can always be notified whenever I upload another video. And of course, have fun.